Great. As Perry's mentioned, um, we're about to embark on a conversation with uh, Claudio Borio, head of the Monetary and Economic Department of the Bank for International Settlements. We're going to be talking about the topic of beyond NEPA towards new accounting uh, systems. And on a personal account, and on behalf of many of the young scholars that are present here today, Claudia, I'll just say that we are readers and fans of your work for many years. Uh, we regularly read uh, uh, BIS reports and especially your papers that you've been writing. Also your colleagues like Inyaki that are here today. We, we've been engaging with them uh, regularly. Um, for us, it's a real pleasure to sort of have this meeting of the minds, um, you and Perry, to open up this conversation um, about this, what Perry referred to earlier, the dark matter uh, that is behind uh, uh, the, the lack of uh, full accounting of what's happening in the world. Just for full disclosure, so this group here is fully immersed in sort of the uh, triple coincidence paper uh, that's we've fully taken that on board. Um, I think we're really interested in understanding uh, what accounting uh, is required for us to better understand the, the, the global character of uh, the international financial system uh, and to not get locked into the standard sort of NEPA constraints that we uh, we encounter that might put misplaced policy recommendations and understanding of policy into this into front and center. But um, without any further ado, I'll also just allow Perry to give his own introduction as well of, of Claudio and uh, start the conversation. It's really a great pleasure uh, to have you both here. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Perry, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Jay. Um, so um, I need to switch the view here so that I can see myself. Um, the um, uh, and and welcome, Claudio. Thank you so much for taking the time out from. Um, saving the world and coming to talk talk to us about longer longer term things, I guess. Um, and uh, the um, uh, just for the, the the sake of the of the audience, um, the origin of this session, um, I think, okay, is is the conversation we were having at the BIS when I came to give a little book talk on on money and empire my book on kindleberger and um when i spoke um uh, in the bilateral um talks both the day before and the day after with you and also with yun shin okay both of you uh we chatted about this problem of of accounting um and and the fact that much of the policy dialogue um, that you're engaged in all the time um, with your counterparts at IMF and so forth um, is using this accounting structure, um, national income and product accounts, which is more than 50 years old um, and was devised in another time for another kind of world. Um, and you're and and both you and Hyun express sort of frustration <laughs> at the ability to have a useful policy dialogue that is limited in, in by by those constraints um and so the need for maybe making some more fundamental advances not not necessarily in theory but in actual measurement um in 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 what we in the accounting structures I think it's worth reminding the young scholars here that, that the national income and product accounts have not always been with us. You know, that they were they were actually sort of invented um, during. I'm I'm not so much a historian of economic thought to know exactly this, but my impression. Somebody will correct me. Um, sort of invented in in the interwar period and uh, and and became um, really to the front in in Keynes' uh, How to Pay for the War, um, and then after the war really uh, became the standard for everyone else because the Marshall Plan required all countries that were applying for money to to frame their ask in the frame of the, every country had its own accounting system. Um, and it, then it all got standardized and the OECD standardized that. So, so these, that's when these accounts were, were created. Okay. They were created in a particular time, a time when there was uh, not much capital flows. And in, in fact, when people thought there weren't going to be, and maybe we shouldn't have capital flows because we wanted to have full employment. And, and so they're, they, they, they potentially have outlived their usefulness. So my my uh, my thought about how to proceed here, and I've chatted with Claudio bef bef before, we had a little chat on Wednesday, um, 
is I have a series of questions, seven of them, which will sort of lead us into this um, and get us to concrete things for about, about accounting. But I think it's useful to start um, uh, and, and to get a little bit acquainted um, to, since we, we have some time, we can, we can walk through this um, and, then, and then open up. So, so here's my question one for you, Claudio. He has these questions in, in, in front of him. Yes, um, that's right. I've got them. So, so this, I'm not. I, I wanted him to know that this is this is not a hostile audience. I'm not gonna. I'm not a journalist. I'm not gonna have a gotcha question or anything like that. Um, this is in the. This is in the spirit of inquiry. Okay, and I think it's helpful for for me to learn and for the and for the audience to learn sort of kind of where you're coming from. So I want to. I want to start with some personal background. I saw on your website that you uh your first you first joined the BIS in 1987 which caught yeah, my eye because that. don't remind me of that. <laughs> which caught my eye because that's exactly the year that I started as an assistant professor at Barnard College um and so we're you had a previous you know at Oxford you were you were your your tr your training um but we're sort of contemporaries I'm not asking you how old you are you know but I know how old I am so uh <laughs> the uh uh, but what's also interesting is that our undergraduate at Oxford, you were not an economics uh, major as an undergraduate. You did PPE, um, and I was not an economics undergraduate either. I, I did thing called social studies at Harvard, um, and yet we both found our way to economics eventually. You know, and uh, PhDs, you did a DPhil, and uh, and and then we found ourselves in very different locations. You know, I've been in academia my whole life, thirty years at Barnard College actually, and you've been at the BIS basically basically your whole life, you know, making your way up. And so um, uh, I, most of the people here, uh, you know, know about my journey, but I don't think they know very much about your journey. Maybe you can tell us, how did you decide you needed to do economics? And how did you decide you needed to do it at the BIS? Okay, uh, well, first of all, um, economics. Um, <clears throat> by the way, I I, I actually, I'm Italian, but I grew up in Argentina, just to sort of give a, oh. a big picture. Things did change a lot in my, in my career. And, and I ended up in the UK by chance after finishing my studies, uh, my undergrad, my, no, my school, uh, school years in, in, in Argentina. And, uh, and I ended up in Oxford, I won't go into the story, but completely by chance as an undergraduate. And it was, you know, the story about sliding doors and and so on. Uh, like, you remember, I don't know whether you remember the movie. Now, one the one aspect which is relevant for this conversation, though, um, is the fact that um, the reason, one reason why, or the reason why I ended up at the university in the UK in Oxford is that at the time I was really undecided as to what I wanted to do. Um, and there were three subjects that were interested uh, in, uh, of interest to me. Uh, one was economics, but probably was not the, the one that attracted me most, at least intellectually. And the other was uh, politics. And the third one, which probably was the one I, again, I liked most or I'm most fond of was, was philosophy. And it turned out, people explained to me that there was this marvelous course in, in Oxford that was doing the three. And so that's how I ended up there. It was completely by chance. Um, and, um, but I think that, in fact, I did study economics uh, at the time. Basically, uh, one was supposed to do, what was it, uh, eight papers. I ended, uh, ended up doing nine, but four of, four of those were, uh, were economics. Um, uh, and I guess that one reason why I did economics was not that I have to be completely honest, was not so much because I was attracted by it intellectually, but more because, well, I, I, th I thought that at some point I, I needed to make a living and, and I didn't think that I could make a living for, for my family if I, if I just did uh, either politics or, or, uh, or philosophy. But I have to say that um, the, uh, the combination of those three, and I guess we'll talk about that a little bit later, was extremely important for my further uh, professional development. And I'm really very glad that uh, I just didn't focus on, on economics uh, at the time. Uh, second point, I, I started actually teaching at the university, but I, I felt that... Um, I was too far removed from actual policy making, and I was really interested in policy. Um, 
So I was attracted to the idea of working in a policy environment in an international organization, so leaving Oxford. And for personal reasons, I thought Europe was more uh, was better than the United States. So I ended up at the OECD. Uh, but before that, they had actually offered me a job at the BIS, and that was through sort of special channels, because in those days there were no ads as, as we do today. Uh, but one of my professors uh, uh, had actually worked at the BIS before, uh, working on gold and euro currency markets, um, and uh, he had suggested my name to, to the people here. So they offered me a job, but I said, no, I haven't finished my PhD or DPhil. I, I would like to go back at the university. And then when I wanted a job here, they didn't have it. So I, I went to the OECD and a couple of years later, they came back and said, would you still like to come? And so I moved. So that's how I ended up in this place. And uh, I have to say that at least revealed preference. I, I, I haven't regretted it. Uh, um, well, the, so I want to ask a little bit about what that is about all that time in the BIS, but let me just tell you, because I don't really know. I've never had a real job, you know. Uh, <laughs> what do you mean you haven't had a real job? <laughs> so the, um, you know, from the outside, you know, what I what I see when I look at the BIS is a central bank for for central banks um, is sort of a, a an institution that offers a very special vantage point for the world. It's sort of on top of you know, if you want to have a global perspective, you know, there you go. You're 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 looking down from on top, and you have all kinds of uh, bank balance sheet data that's proprietary that's that no one else has that you can put together in in form of view, I guess, of what's happening. Happening. And 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 I guess the third thing is 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 so not just just a position and data, um, but the fact that there's no uh, nation state, you know, as opposed to every other central bank, which which really is under the thumb of its treasury ultimately. Um, the that's not so true of the BIS. So there's a kind of independence um, th th uh, that that is possible there, um, or at least that's what. I don't know. That's what it looks like from the outside. Um, you can tell me what it's like in the inside. What I'm interested in is, so you've been in that position since 87. There's so many changes in the world. What, you know, globalization, financialization, you know, how, what, what does that look like from that vantage point? Okay, so first a couple of words about the, uh, about the BIS and what's really special about this place. Um, First of all, what's special relative to other institutions is that we have a very, very, very clear clientele, uh, which are central banks. We know that we're working for four central banks, and that's extremely important. I, this is something that was a little bit missing at the at, at the OECD because some of the stuff that we were doing was very similar to the IMF. So the question is, what's so special? But clear, there is a sense of purpose that sometimes is not as as concrete in other institutions. Then huge number of advantages. First of all, uh, good points about the place. As you said, we have a global perspective, but in that sense, it's not unique uh, because also the IMF, for example, does. But we are very, very close to top policymakers, all of us. I mean, the, the relationship that we have with the senior policymakers that come here during the bimonthly which are mainly the governors, but also other times of the year, one or two notches below the below the governors is uh, it's like a con constant contact that gives us a very very good sense of what's going out, going on out there. What are the key concerns as policymakers? And of course, everything as a result, everything that is at the intersection of uh, money, finance, and macro. Uh, that's really the focus of of this place. We have a banking department that actually manages a portion of global FX reserves. Uh, we have committees, in particular the Basel Committee, which uh, focuses on banking regulation. We have the Committee on Payments and Markets Infrastructure that focuses on uh, uh, payments and settlement systems, clearing systems. Um, we have a number of high level committees of central bankers that focus on financial markets too. And of course, we do a lot of work on finance, macro and monetary policy. And, and, and they, that means that if you're working in this place, and unless you try to 
you really want to be uh, focused on a particular issue, which we don't allow people to be, uh, then you, you can really get a perspective that is broader than what you would get, say, if you are um, in a place where the only thing that you're doing is macroeconomics or the only thing that you're doing is financial finance or, or whatever. So that's, that's the specific vantage point uh, that we have here. Huge transformation of the world, that, that's clearly played very much to the strength of the institution. Uh, we have gone from uh, what used to be a government-led to a market-led global monetary and financial system. This is uh, basically the expression that, uh, what, uh, that was used by uh, Pados Kiop and Sakomani in a famous essay that they wrote in the early 90s. So this is financial globalization, but we've also had, we've moved from a government-led to a market-led real economy system, and this is real globalization. And these are really two sides of the, of the same coin, and they have uh, meant that they have been huge, they have been the key engines for this huge transformation in, in the dynamics of the, of the world economy since the mid-1980s. And of course, the key, uh, implications of all this, and this speaks very much to your concerns, is that financial factors have moved from the periphery to the core of economic fluctuations. This was not the case when the financial system was largely repressed in the days that you were referring to before. Um, and this has interacted with uh, both um, the real economy aspects, real globalization, and with the way that monetary policy was articulated to, to change the, the dynamics of the, of the global economy. Or one way in which we have put it is that economic fluctuations, which in the past were largely driven by uh, higher inflation, central bankers response to inflation uh, until say the mid 1980s. From then onwards, and if we leave the COVID uh, crisis aside, and now the very unique experience that we're living through again, they move from, uh, from this inflation-induced fluctuations to financial, financial-induced fluctuations or financial cycle-induced fluctuations. And this also explains the fact that if you think of the way that central bankers have changed over time since the days that you mentioned, their focus of interest has also changed to some extent uh, from inflation to, to, financial, to financial stability, which was not a, a, an issue at the time. Um, I mean, uh, and this is reflected, for example, in a couple of things. First of all, in the focus of the committees that we had here at the BIS. Um, first of all, the creation of the Basel committee in the in the 1970s the committee which is responsible for regulation and supervision in the world setting the standards mm -hmm. for banks which was created as a result of herstadt the, uh, the failure of herstadt which had faced problems in the foreign exchange market uh, to the creation of the uh, committee on payments and settlement systems which is now called the committee on payments and market infrastructure but started looking very closely at the risks in payment and settlement system. Again, you're going back to your uh, constraint, that uh, your settlement constraint. And even the BIS International Banking Statistics that you, you mentioned earlier, which is really the only set of international banking and financial statistics, which is really the only set of statistics over which we have a comparative advantage because they are, they are created here. Um, in the early 1960s and 70s, the statistics were created because of concerns about what you might call monetary stability and inflation, the growth, the growth in the euro dollar markets in, in Europe, concerns that the authorities that at the time were very much focused on um, monetary aggregates were losing control of monetary aggregates because a lot of money creation was outside their domestic borders. Two concerns with sovereign risk. Uh, and the financial crisis that we saw in emerging market economies starting uh, at the time. Um, and in fact, the, so the international banking statistics, the focus and so on, and some of the aspects that have to do with the triple coincidence that we discussed before, were really emerged out of this huge shift in the, in the global economy. 
So you're you're saying what it looked like, but also how the BIS sort of changed its its mission and responded to these challenges, um, which were policy challenges as the Absolutely. as the central problem. Um, and Actually, so, and I have to say that it's roughly joined at the time where the concerns were shifting from inflation to financial stability. Because if my first my first uh, assignment when I joined was to write a chapter in the annual report on uh, uh, the stock market crash. <laughs> and the, uh, yes. so I had- I remember that. <laughs> an expert in, uh, in financial markets. But so you can see that the concerns mm. were already shifting. Uh, yeah. Um, so um, I lived through this financial market uh, transformation myself, um, you know, but uh, as an outsider really. Um, and, uh, uh, it, the, the financial system has evolved and transformed, but academic economics and academic finance, not so much. I mean, this is a very slow moving beast, maybe because of tenure or I don't know what, you know, the, uh, and uh, so I have been, I felt myself to be without intellectual sort of uh, tools at the beginning. And I had to find things. It, it did not seem to me that the that the economics that I had learned in graduate school was really helping me very much. And uh, so I, you know, people people on this uh, on this call know that I kind of originally, I went back and I tried to find somebody who seemed to know what they were doing in, in the history of economics. And so that was my first book, you know, finding these American institutionalists, Alan Young and, 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 and so forth. Um, and then once I felt like I knew where to start, I started with the MOOC trying to. Oops, I muted Perry instead of the other person. I'm not sure what you missed there, but the, uh, so I was so and then I and then I decided uh, it was actually when I was studying Minsky I realized how did he know what he know he read the financial press and so I said well that's I guess what I have to do and so I read Stigum I read Financial Times and eventually of course all the BIS papers that you and your colleagues were generating so I've learned from from my empirical basis you know came from that my theoretical basis came from this older. Uh, older tradition, a tradition that was really in its prime during the period of the Sterling system. You know, so there, I all I always told students, you can you can learn more from people who wrote a hundred years ago than from people who who wrote ten years yeah. ago. You know, yeah. because they're talking about a system very similar to the world that we're living in now. So, but my question for you. What were your resources? What were your intellectual resources? Because you came, I'm sure, from a very similar academic training, and you maybe found yourself, you know, without <laughs> that this stuff was not all that useful for you. So you had to invent things. I, 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 in a way, my journey is not that different from yours. Um, uh, but first of all, I mean, when you say, uh, when you talk about Stigum, I, I remember, I think it was a book on money markets. Is, is, yes, is correct. The one you have in mind? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I have to say that what I've learned in Oxford helped and, and didn't help. Um, it helped in the in, in in the sense that, as a result of my uh, my experience, well, I would say both in Oxford and, and and before, I I I became, particularly when I was here, an avid uh, reader of economic history and uh, the history of economic thought, and I guess that has to do in part with the this marriage of the Hegelian tradition that actually I inherited from my days when I was school following the in the Italian system to the Anglo-Saxon tradition of the importance of poly uh, and the uh, which pays a lot of attention to language and I try to sort of marry the two in, in the work that uh, I have been doing and then of course the importance of politics and history that uh, I did as an undergraduate and I think that many of the views that I have about the uh, about how the economy works actually have had the origin in, in this type of reading from the hidden perils of the great moderation going back to the focus on financial cycles that used to be there particularly during the first year of globalization given that we were talking about globalization before uh, the false i would say perils of deflation views about the natural rates and, and and so on and and, and so forth um, now as far as economics um, i 
I do think that the basic training in economics that I had uh, at, in, in Oxford was very useful. I would not have been able to do anything without that. Um, but I also think that I, I was fortunate to have very good advisors uh, who sort of uh, introduced me to issues of monetary economics and financial systems, uh, but with a very open and inquisitive mind, as opposed to this is what you have to learn because this is what people say and I, I and i thought that that was extremely important now when i clearly when i came to the bis i had to broaden my horizon i couldn't stop there um i have to say that for example i didn't even know despite the fact that i had worked on capital on banking i didn't know what capital was <laughs> or what capital was there for because all of the models of banks that we had studied at the university actually abstracted from capital. They were either portfolio models or they were models in which, you know, the banking model of Monty and Klein that didn't actually have a role for capital in it. Um, and so and I felt that if I wanted to learn about economics and if I wanted to be a good economist here at an institution that works for central banks, I had to broaden my horizons. So I worked in financial markets, I worked in banking, and worked in regulation and supervision. I even taught myself accounting. Uh, um, then I worked a lot on payments and settlement systems. I worked on monetary policy implementation, reserve management, tried to cover as many areas as possible to try and cross fertilize my understanding of things. And I have to say that the area, believe it or not, but the area that I think had the biggest influence of my general thinking was monetary policy implementation. Right? So this obscure little corner of in, in the economic system, which is, which is the secret power of central banks to set interest rates. And there I did learn that everything that I had learned at university was wrong, that it had bear no resemblance to to what was going on in the real world. And that was a major eye opener. And one of the things, one of the key insights that it gave me is that this huge financial system that we were talking about ultimately rested on this, on the central bank setting the overnight rate and how little traction it could have on the overall system, the, the lack of anchor, because even things like capital and, and the like depend on asset prices for their measurement. And asset prices ultimately are affected by the interest rate, but but in a way which is very loose. And then notions of liquidity and the like come in. So this is the strange intellectual journey that I that I followed, if you if you like. Hmm. Um, so you were saying that you 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 felt it. It was um, more similar to me than than I had expected, and and I, I hear that um, one picking up maybe one strand of what you said. You had to, to teach yourself accounting. Um, I uh, since we're, this is a session where we're going to be talking about accounting. I um, I you're you're mostly talking about uh, I think microeconomic accounting. You know, yeah. accounting for yeah. banks here. Whereas um, I also had to teach myself accounting, but I ha I was teaching myself sort of macroeconomic accounting, um, and so. Um, one of the key things I started to use in teaching was, was in fact, sources and uses of funds accounting, yeah. which has become flow of funds, but it's got a little bastardized in the process. But so I went back to Copeland and his original idea in 1952 and, and even before the war. Um, and, and I found that very illuminating, you know, to, 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 to visualize the world as a money flow world, you know, which I'm sure from the BIS, of course, this is a money flow world, you know, but that mm -hmm. that was that was a new idea to me. Uh, I I remember, and I incorporated that sort of into my teaching. That was a huge huge help. Um, I remember it was Alan Young who said we can just understand basically the the banking system as a settlement system. That that's really what's happening. It's checks clearing. That's what's happening. Mm -hmm. And I thought that is so different from money demand equals money supply. You know, um, but I I can see his point. You know, let's see if we could do something with that. And of course, he came out of that American institutionalist tradition, Copeland, all, all of that. There, there, that's that's that was a view. You know, Mitchell had that view. Maybe you were not exposed to the American institutionalists as much because you're in at Oxford. And well, but I, but I, this was my foundation was these American this American institutionalist tradition. Well, I I sort of discovered them 
a bit later when uh, I was I was actually writing a piece on uh, money, debt, trust, and central banking, and sort of I was doing some reading, and I came across this this tradition as well in that context. Um, uh, the nature of money, the relationship with debt, and, and and so on and so forth. Now, clearly, and I think there are a number of very useful insights in in there. Um, uh, you can imagine that for someone that followed my the kind of uh, journey, intellectual journey that and um, professional journey that I described earlier, uh, when marrying these issues of uh, as I mentioned earlier, monetary policy implementation with an understanding of payment and settlement and clearing systems. That again was another complete black box because uh, uh, I was hearing about these things and I didn't understand what it was all about because clearly it's something that we had not, not learned at university. Marrying that with the what's happening in financial markets and what's happening in the banking system is bound to have a a big influence on on your thinking and um, and together with that yes I, I I played around a lot with the uh, flow of funds not Copeland I wasn't I wasn't even aware of Copeland I have to say uh, but with flow of funds analysis um, although I, I I found it useful up to a point uh, I also feel that the way in which it is joined up with uh, what you call NIPA you know the national accounts is is a little bit artificial and uh, in some respects it can actually take you intellectually in the wrong direction but that's a yes that's well a, that's why i i am now of course copla the original book was you know money flows of the united states so it would not have come across your your uh you know your radar because it seemed domestic or something i will um, read it after this after this you know i will read it well so so i will let other people just say he was definitely looking for an accounting system that was an alternative not only to mv equals pt you know quantity theory you know which is one way of organizing your thinking but also c plus i plus g equals y which was he thought was too aggregative and it wasn't so he was looking for an accounting structure that you could do macroeconomics with okay and mm. so that that was why i grabbed a hold of him and that macroeconomics has yet you know that accounting structure that he proposed you know is i think maybe where we could start you know but the uh we'll come we'll come back to that what what i what's interesting is because you're at the bis you naturally have an inter international point of view whereas mm. you know i'm i'm in the united states and so i naturally had a domestic view and it took me a long time to kind of get to it's only really in the last 10 years that i've become become really embrace the international and one of and I, I just want to draw attention to one of your one of the things that you that you sort of invented which is kind of accounting really is this sort of distinction between saving and financing that you did in this paper um with uh with this um and i i've now created little problem sets for my students you know based on that little model there about how the same transaction you know um is going to be booked in different ways depending on the location of the financial intermediaries and so forth and so it that that here's here's a maybe an entry point into the way that our accounting system can can give us misleading information unless we're somehow drilling deeper um could you tell me so that that paper um uh, well, it was a paper, and then then there was like a, a public talk. I actually assigned my students the public talk. A public it's talk? Easier. Where, where, where? No, you gave a public talk about it. It was a lecture or something. Um, that's that's a sort of that references the 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 underlying, uh, I think BIS working paper or something. But uh, I used the underlying working paper to create a problem set for my students, and and I assigned them the the lecture. Um, the uh, but so I'm I'm interested where that seems to me a very I mean I I sent you also this paper that Kindleberger wrote where he was really concerned that the way we were measuring balance of payments it looked like the U.S. had a trade deficit um, and that and that that was a problem and he was saying no that's just an artifact of how we do the international account. Um, in fact, the U.S. is supplying liquidity to the world, and the world and the world wants that. As a matter of fact, so this is not actually this is just 
you're you're not understanding what the role of the United States of, of in New York, in fact, in particular, was. Um, neither the Europeans, UK, okay, nor nor the American politicians who are imagining like Kennedy. We're imagining we have a balanced payments difference. So, so this problem of how our our existing set of accounts distorts our understanding um, made me made me attracted to your piece. And so I wonder, could you tell me a little bit how that how that piece came about? I think it's a very deep and fundamental piece. I I think everyone should read it. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I, I have to say that it's uh, it's always a struggle. Uh, it's a big struggle to uh, even with my colleagues very often to to clarify that distinction because they it simply it, it doesn't come to them. But I have to say that I'm not. I don't think that we invented the, the this distinction. We may have put it in those terms, but uh, I, I think that the similar idea you you can find in, in some of the post Keynesian work uh, that has uh, that it's there. And I think we have a couple of references in, in the piece. Um, now, the original, we, we wrote two pieces. I think that the one with the little model is, is, is uh, something, one which is, uh, which talks about taking financing more seriously or, or, or something. But we, the, the first piece in which we discuss this, and that goes back to the origin of the work, was uh, one in 2011, when, uh, which was designed to take on the, the global saving glut hypothesis, uh, which we felt was not ap approaching the issues in the right way. And, and in that, uh, I mean, I'm sure that people remember uh, the, uh, the the whole hypothesis basically said that current account surpluses in Asia, and of course uh, 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 China was a key player there, but also Japan, were financing the the bubble in in in, in the United States and pushing interest rates down, and therefore were at the core of the of the crisis. Now the paper had basically two was making two separate points. One is a point about accounting, and the other is a point about behavior. Uh, the point about behavior, which we don't need to get into here, is has to do with where the interest rates are determined, how interest rates are determined, and the relationship between the natural and the, and the market interest rate. But let's leave that aside for the moment, given the focus of this presentation. Um, the one about accounting is, it's very simple. I mean, start even with a closed economy idea. Um, uh, and the uh, saving is equal to investment and or uh, income is equal to consumption plus investment plus government spending plus exports minus, uh, minus imports in an open economy. But this idea that saving is, um, is somehow something that has to go into investment you know I, you very often hear this view that saving is uh is this wall that has to go somewhere okay you have to invest it in a financial asset and it has to go into into investment that's completely wrong i mean saving is the is a kind of hole it's not a wall it's a hole in in aggregate spending that allows room for investment and that's a a, a real account identity. Um, and then you have got the financing aspects that have not have nothing to do with that. They have got to do with cash flows. They are cash flow concepts and are, the, are at the core of our understanding of uh, intermediation as well. And so the point was basically made in the paper is that there was no relationship between the current account surpluses in, in Asia and the, the financing of the of the bubble in in the United States, um, and that what we saw was not a crisis that had to do with current account and accumulation of reserves, possibly related to that and the official sector, but if it was a crisis that had to do with growth flows, not net flows, and with financing you know, on the private side, which was basically European banks financing what was going on in the United States. So these two circuits, which is real economy and, or to put it differently, obviously all real transactions are financed, <laughs> but that you cannot look at that 
through the perspective of the saving and investment accounting equation or identity. Mm -hmm. So th th that's really, and but that's also true in the domestic uh, in the domain in the domestic uh, environment in which saving have very little to do with the creation of uh, purchasing power, with the creation of money, and with financial intermediation. Mm -hmm. So, just to uh, 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 circle around, so the saving glut which was, I mean, I lived through this period, this was the dominant view um, in, in American uh, Academy. I think it was Bernanke and, and, and others, you know, pushing this idea. Um, and, uh, the, uh, and the BIS developed, you developed, uh, your colleagues developed this alternative. I think, hmm. was it, what didn't you call it? The banking glut view? Hewn called it that. Hewn called it that. Because it was Hewn, a nice coinage, I thought. Yeah. He was working independently. Okay. Uh, of that. Uh, but he came up with ideas which were fully consistent with uh, with that analysis. He called it the banking glut. Okay. Uh, uh, we, we didn't use that term in the in the paper. Um, uh, I can't actually remember whether we used a particular term for it. Uh, but we focused very much on which is probably not as sexy, but you know about the saving versus financing idea. Mm -hmm. Um, the you 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 mentioned at the very beginning of that uh, account that it's difficult to explain this to other people. <laughs> so this is this is getting this is getting to our point, I guess, about accounting that, that accounting sort of is is a kind of er language, you know, which 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 shapes what can be said and what can't be said, um, and that people who are used to and, and they imagine that the accounting system they know maps onto the world, okay? And so they don't need to look at the world. They just need to think about, think within that accounting framework. And, and that this is, this leads to blinders. So it is, is really kind of the point that you're, that you're, that you're making. Um, and, uh, and so now we're, we're, we're trying to, uh, Think about what kinds of of, of accounting structures um, would would be better. Okay, and you mentioned a few things here. Okay, for example, gross flows, not net flows. Okay, so of course NEPA is entirely net flows. Okay, um, and uh, the uh, and uh, and seeing, I mean, in some ways, this is the same point about uh, realizing that you know savings is. Kind of a residual between two very large numbers, you know, and 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 net net capital flows are a residual between two very large numbers, you know, and so the uh, understanding what's happening, um, maybe you should look at the large numbers, and uh, and and see what's and see what's driving them. Which is them. basically what Findelberger was was doing. Uh, yes. Already at a time in which these numbers were not that large, they might. Have, they were not large relative to the net, but they, were, they still played a very important role. I mean, it's it's how can you think about it this in this terms? Uh, we are interested in finance. We're interested in intermediation. How can you think about intermediation? How can you think about financial crisis uh, if you're just looking at net? It just doesn't make any sense. The banks uh, disappear. Mean, I mean, and as we, and as we even argue, and as we argue in, in the second paper that uh, you mentioned, when uh, this idea of um, uh, sudden stops, uh, which is articulated in terms of net flows, again, it's, it's a bit of a misnomer because the sudden stop is in financing flows, and those are really growth flows. Uh, and then you have to, you have to look at the stocks. You have to look at intermediation in order to understand how those financing flows stop. And that's, that, of course, can have it will have implications for the current account. Will have implications for trade. But it's on the financial side that the sudden stop occurs. Mm -hmm. And you can, it's even it's it's again it's I would say it's semantically wrong to talk about a sudden stop in in the current account. Because you cannot mm -hmm. have any such thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, um, uh, yeah, sorry. So, so all of this um, 
it seems to me, you know, as somebody who sometimes writes intellectual biography, this whole, it, the, the availability of the international banking statistics, okay, seems to be sort of key that you're working with all of that. And so that's the image you get of the world comes from intimate familiarity with that. And you can build empirical counterparts to these ideas of financing flows and so forth and have and have done. Um, so I want to move toward, so that's a sort of beginning of an alternative accounting structure of a kind, but there are other resources too. And one uh, that, that I, I gave a talk at the Office of Financial Research once um, uh, after the global financial crisis that was set up, um, and and they are, they basically have carte blanche to get any data they want, um, and they but they didn't they didn't know what to ask for or what to do with it when they got it. Okay, and so they invited people like me down to tell them, and I and I was trying to push this Copeland view, okay, which is to sort of start with the transaction. Okay, to be to and and of course they have transactions data on everything, you know, and and, and um, really in any every individual transaction. So the thing that held Copeland back a lot was that to to construct his set of accounts, he had to use sort of annual balance sheet data. Okay, so and 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 so you're there's a lot of transactions that are leading to changes in stocks, you know, from one year to the next, and you don't see them at all. Okay, um, and and he also aggregated up into sectors, um, and so there's a lot of intersect intrasectoral stuff that that gets that gets washed out in that in those sorts of. But it seems to me that there that it might be possible with modern computers too. You know, he did the whole thing with pencil and paper in 1952. You know, <laughs> that we and digital information that it might be possible to to start at a at that more granular level, you know, and um, I know Huyen has always wanted to like build up to, to new aggregates. And it seems, it's always seemed to me like the aggregates are the problem here. You know, that we, we, we want, we want to understand the granular, you know, this, the, the important things are happening at a more granular level. So, so this, I don't know if, if there are other, so, so I guess one question is, does this transaction level, the availability of transaction level data, um, is this something that you know you th you think from your experience um, could be a resource for for building and 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 what other data resources are you aware of that we might conceivably use as the basis for a better accounting system? Uh, there, I'm probably more skeptical than you are. I the if you just look at the volume of payments, that gives the sense of the transaction, right? Even if in some cases it's clear. Um, I mean, I think these numbers you can find uh, in some of the BIS publications. Uh, you can find the orders of magnitude also in that, um, in that uh, paper that, or lecture that I mentioned earlier about money, debt, trust, and central banking. I mean, they are huge. They're really huge compared with uh, GDP. Um, uh, so, and of course, payments are the counterpart to, or one of the two legs of the transactions that you're you're talking about. Um, at the retail level, there are many many transactions, but the overall volumes, and by retail level, I mean uh, transactions that are not within the financial system or ultimately make their way in the interbank transactions. They're very small. Actually, yes, yes. Those are those are mostly related to to the real side of the economy, but there is a huge the, the transactions that take place within the financial system are absolutely huge. Yeah, I'm Copeland not really Copeland sure. called those fluff, you know. Because well, he... <laughs> I mean, maybe I mean, depends, is that fluff? I'm not sure. Well, of it's, course, uh, it's not today. You know, he's yeah, writing so... in '52. <laughs> And exactly. I always tell students that if a man from Mars came down and looked at the United States, he would say, oh, I know what money, money is what you use to, to make financial transactions. Like, yeah. because that's that's what it almost all is. And and large financial transactions, you know, the 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 special payment system for, for large magnitude uh, uh, transactions. Right, large value uh, payment yeah. systems. I mean, uh, yeah. so they're absolutely huge. I'm not really sure what knowing each individual transaction will help you to- Okay. Uh, to achieve. Um, 
Uh, right. We're, we're trying to open up this field, not resolve it. So yeah, the, right. and maybe there'll be some, some uh, suggestions. And by the way, uh, Perry, yeah. I, I, I remember having discussions with uh, uh, people at the OFR. Actually, at the time it was uh, Lou Alexander who had actually worked with us here at the BS for some time, then he'd come to the board and Dick Berner, and they sort of had come here uh, precisely uh, at the time when they were thinking of, uh, of uh, getting all of these transactions, um, uh, transactions data. And I have to say that we were more on the skeptical side about what they might be able to use once they had all that data. Um, now, I'm not saying that it is not possible, and I'm not discouraging you and your colleagues from following this, um, this line of thought, but um, I think that it's a big mountain to climb. Um, well, you and I are, are <laughs> older, <laughs> but some people here are younger, and, <laughs> and, and, and they're looking for big mountains because but they have, to, they have what, 20 what, years. They can do it. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, but what I'm, what I'm trying to say is... Yeah. Uh, start with a clear idea precisely of what would you do once you have that data, Yeah. Uh, which I don't really have, uh, mm -hmm. and then uh, decide, uh, and, but that's necessary to provide guidance about, yes, and to get incentives for people to, to collect it. I mean, for example, there is all of this huge amounts of data of transactions that have to do with uh, exchanges and derivatives and, and so on and so forth. The question is, okay, once we have that data, what is that you can really shed light on? Uh, I can imagine that you can shed uh, light on issues of market um, functioning. I can imagine that you can shed light on issues of market manipulation. I can imagine that you can shed some light on uh, issues that have to do with uh, stability within those systems and, and the like. I am less uh, convinced that you can shed light on the, some of these broader macroeconomic issues that we are mm -hmm. uh, discussing just by looking at those individual transactions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the I actually would talk with Zoltan Poser about this a little bit too, about extending the sources and uses to be tracking not just money flows, but collateral flows, you know, as, well, I mean, that, for example. That's, an, that's a different issue. I mean, if yeah. you, um, if you're, and indeed there are some efforts that are not really going, that are going more slowly than we had hoped uh, following the great financial crisis under the aegis of the FSB to collect more information on collateral markets. Uh, and again, they're happening here, um, but uh, we have been hitting some obstacles and something that we hope would have been ready already by now, it's still moving pretty slowly. But mm -hmm. clearly understanding better the, the behavior of collateral markets and, and putting together both quantity and price uh, information, yes, uh, I think it's extremely important because the huge... Sure. If there has been a huge shift in that interesting picture, if there has been a huge shift in the uh, in the uh, in the financial system since the mid 1980s, has been a shift from uh, assessing counterparty risk based on cash flows and the like, to uh, basically assessing the value of collateral, yes. um, and. This has had a huge impact on, on the dynamics of markets and the dynamics of financial distress uh, that I, at least would bear, uh, would deserve a lot of close study. Um, yeah, so, so the, the that, rise of- The rise of market-based finance, you know, uh, yeah. is, is sort of what you're talking about here, shadow, so-called shadow banking. But it's, it's, the, beyond, it's, it's beyond that because it, it also has a first order impact on, on the behavior of banks. And although people very often think mm -hmm. of, and you know this, people tend to think of markets and, and banks as alternative sources of funding and, and, and so on. But these are markets that are very, very closely intertwined because at the end mm -hmm. of the day, the banks are market makers in, in most of these markets. They are the key yes. market makers. So we need to yeah. understand the interaction between the two. So one, one last question, and then we'll open it up so that the audience can start thinking about this. 
you mentioned just now, okay, that we need measures of quantities and prices. So you started to bring prices into the picture. In my own thinking, as everyone here knows, you know, the way I bring prices into pictures is through the trainer model of the dealer function, that you're mm -hmm. imagining that these prices are, are not you know, looking at fundamental value as you would in, in finance, but that they're being determined by um, order flow um, and order flow imbalances that are, that are pushing around the dealer balance sheet and so forth. Now, since I started with Copeland, Copeland does not do any valuation changes. You know, he's really just looking at money flows. And, and the important thing is that, of course, valuation changes cause cash flows now mm -hmm. <laughs> because of these derivatives and so forth. So you, you, have, to ha you have to put valuation in there. Um, and yep. often, you know, I remember when the, when the global financial crisis happened, you know, that the uh the advantage that i had in you know in 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 watching this was to say well it, to to know like if there's a spread between the euro dollar rate and the fed funds rate okay that means something about the imbalances in 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 cash flows um that we can know where the problem is so that prices actually carry information about quantities um, and so, um, and I know you've you've done a little work, um, uh, and I, I'm going to quote you from more than 20 years ago. You wrote in the BIS Quarterly Review, and here's a quote: "The illusion of permanent market liquidity, which is an assumption in most of economics, um, is probably the most insidious threat to liquidity itself. Markets are expected to be liquid; loans are known not to be. So, if you are the data czar, you know." How would you how would you measure the price of liquidity? It seems to me this is a this is a you know it's a conceptual point, but it's also an empirical point. Yeah, uh, yeah. I tried. By the way, I mean you don't know this, but I with with actually some people here look, looking at like the difference between futures prices and forward prices just because of the mark to market things, saying like there must be a price of liquidity in there somewhere, or or looking at other places in the world where you might. See, you might say that gap, okay, is not counterparty risk, okay? Yeah, it's yeah. it's the price of liquidity. You know, if you don't have a box called the price of liquidity, you dump it all into counterparty risk. You know, or and uh, and 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 that's the problem that we need to create a new box in order to measure some of these things, a new a new analytical box. No, that, that's true. I mean, first of all, liquidity itself is a uh, uh, is a sort of difficult concept to uh, sort of to identify to I would say delineate um, in in the piece that you mentioned like over 20 years ago yeah uh, which was actually written as a result of some work that had been done by one of the committees that I mentioned earlier at the time I was secretary to, to this committee and uh, it was looking at the uh, at the experience of LTCM, I think it was, mm -hmm. uh, which the long-term capital management for those of you youngsters. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and uh, and the committee came up with this. Uh, it wasn't me, <laughs> to be absolutely clear. Came up with this very nice way of describing the LTCM crisis as a global margin call, which I thought was extremely effective as a as a summary of the of the situation. And I, by looking at that, I realized that, again, the literature on, um, on uh, liquidity, the microstructure literature on liquidity was probably not focusing on the right question because it was all about the underlying asymmetric information about the, the value of the underlying asset, you know, uh, like a piece of equity or, or, or whatever. So the seller knows more and the buyer about the, the price and that starts it sort of generates our limited liquidity and, and so on whereas in fact the the liquidity uh, market liquidity is very closely related to funding liquidity and what intermediates the two of course is the profit motive and in particular risk management practices so this is a very different way of looking at things and that's so why i, I Sorry. So anyway, I'm just I'm fascinated to hear about the origins of this because it's uh, one of the very first things that I wrote way back 20 
years ago was a little piece called Minsky and Modern Finance, because I sort of started with Minsky in trying to understand things and LTCM collapsed. And I thought, well, if this framework is any good, okay, it should give you some insight. And so I wrote this thing for my class. I was teaching money and banking just starting then. And I wrote it up and people seemed to like it. And so I sent it to the Financial Analyst Journal and they published it. No, it wasn't the Financial Analyst, it was Journal of Portfolio Management. Okay. And so I published it, you know, that was such a weird thing to do for an assistant professor <laughs> to be publishing Minsky and in, in, in Modern Finance. But that was really, it was the long-term capital management collapse that particularly because that was, you know, these were the best and the brightest, you know, finance right. minds, you know, and right. so it showed they missed something. They missed yeah. something really quite, quite crucial. Um, and uh, but let's but let's open up now. Um, okay. um, Jay, Jay, do you want to organize this thing? Call happy, people. happy to yeah. facilitate. I think uh, that's probably probably best. Yeah. So great. Um, I think we're going to start with those who just raised their hands, Dan and then Asker. You, you two go ahead. Thanks, Jay. Uh, and thank you, Claudio, uh, very much for, for being here as part of this. Uh, fascinating to hear your your perspectives on some of these questions and also your journey as an economist. And thank you, Perry, as always, um, for the questions and facilitation. Um, I feel like in this conversation around many things, but but focused on uh, macro accounting, let's say, or, or um, uh, systemic accounting, we could call it. I hear two ideas or two, uh, let's say, perspectives on the question, which are clear, and I wanna add a third. The two that we have are, this is a, um, an intellectual project that could be undertaken following Copeland's lead, but, but obviously rethinking it for our time, that's one. Another is, this could be an important tool in being able to make policy for institutions like the BIS, but also central banks, uh, others. And there's a third, which is that this is something which is already being done but but sort of casually and not systematically. And that's what I want to add. This is something already being done, for example, um, in a sort of double entry way by uh, by big companies, think Amazon, that manage their own internal data in a way that's never been done in the past. So I don't know exactly how they account for that, but they have transaction level data, re retail and and not in the financial space, but but in a, an important sector in the retail um, um, world. This is being done by the People's Bank of China. They put out a paper on their digital currency. At least one of the reasons that they wanna use this is to have fine grained, to, to as, as a way of implementing monetary policy, to be able to have fine grained control over spending flows. And the way they do that is by building a monetary system that gives them a window onto transaction level detail. So in a way, I would say I, either of those are versions of this project being done for private interests or being done for state control interests. But I wonder if we might be able to see those efforts as at least the beginning for a project with different motives and different tools and to follow that example uh, in a direction that might lead towards better academic thinking about the economic system, better policy making for the global public good, that kind of thing. Thank you. Well, I, you mentioned a number of things, um, but and the, what is common in what you said is data. Uh, but of course, data in that context is being used for very, very different reasons. I mean, you alluded to some of them. Uh, in the case of Amazon, is about understanding people's preferences, what people are like and what they're more likely to buy and at what price. Uh, they're trying to make money out of understanding, making a better profiling people much more closely. Um, in, the case of, uh, in the case of the PBOC, actually they made, uh, one of their main concerns at, uh, at the time was the fact that there was a lot, going back to payments, that there was a lot of intra, uh, these big companies were internalizing a lot of payments. Um, and that was, could not so much 
undermine the ability at the time the ability of the authorities to implement monetary policy but more generating systemic systemic risk and they wanted to bring that back onto the balance sheet of the of the central bank and then there could of course be broader broader reasons why why they're doing it so my sense is that uh, if you if you want to build a, a, a particular accounting system or measurement system more generally, um, then I think that you you would need to start from the question, what am I going to use it for? And once you identify that question, then that would sort of uh, help you define what it is that you would like to have in the ideal world and given what uh, where we are how much more information we need and how we're going to get it so i would i would start from the end as opposed to we've got all of this data what can we do with it um, um, and it's not it's not an easy it's not an easy question because ultimately there is a, hu a, a very important theoretical element to measurement, and uh, and I think this is what uh, basically Perry was alluding to. I mean, measurement for measurement's sake is not going to take you very far, and uh, for all its uh, faults, the the national accounts are, I think, a, a, a an impressive, truly impressive uh, sort of uh, intellectual effort that has helped our profession organize our thinking a lot if you going back to what we were saying earlier perry if you read uh some of the previous uh the work that was done before the creation of the national accounts people who are not using the same language uh, there was a lot of discussion about hoarding saving and whatever and that was also very confusing i, st I still said that things are confusing today but they were even more confusing uh, confusing in those days so i think that you need to start from a very clear idea about uh, what is that you want to achieve why you want to collect particular data why you want to measure it the way that you're thinking of and then and taking it from there great thank you asker you're next yes uh Thank you so much. This is like um, mind blowing for me. So I will need to rewatch this before coming to anything close to solutions. But uh, it's a fascinating start and great to get this combination from, from Perry and Polio. And I want to point out to the audience that this, this paper, adding, adding in one more paper, only 12 year old from 2012. Uh, the financial cycle, I think it was called, where Borio has the quote that I used in my thesis about banks creating money ex nihilo or out of thin air. And the Nobel Prize Committee last December explicitly stating when they gave to Bernanke and, and um, Diamond Dibbuk that, of course, banks create money, but not out of thin air. So, so there is a, a dispute. <laughs> follow up and, and I well I mean I, I didn't read what the committee said um uh, and again of course let me and underline the point uh, the, the observation that ban banks create money out of thin air is uh is not it's not something that I came up with it's something that is well known uh and I guess is well known also from anyone who works in banks um I mean, it's, it's very simple. If uh, someone wants to borrow from you, um, say a, a firm drawing on a credit line, well, what are you going to do? I mean, you give credit to this, uh, to this person, to this entity, and gi being giving credit to that entity means that you're creating a deposit to sort of, you're creating purchasing power that you're gonna be giving to this entity. So it's, a, it's, it's extremely, it's plain, I mean, it's not it's not something over which we should have an argument i mean it, it no, no. this is a plain and, and this... fact of plain. no i'm not saying i'm, I'm not talking to you right I, I, no, I know no. that you are you are you agree with it but i find it mind-boggling that 
after so many uh, years, we're still here arguing whether banks are creating money or not, or whether the central bank is creating money or not uh, out of thin air. Uh, mm -hmm. Any 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 entity that can issue means of payment, uh, that can issue means of payment, will be creating money out of thin air. And it's a huge privilege to be able to, to do that. And banks have that privilege these days that ultimately rely on the central bank and trust in the central bank to be able to carry out that function, trust in the central bank. Then we've got deposit insurance. We've got a whole institutional apparatus which is trying to limit the creation uh, of money. And by the way, again, I, for those that haven't read it, I think that you might find this um, this lecture that I gave on money that trust and central banking interesting because it goes all it goes into it starts from the payment system and then it, it goes into all these various notions of money debt and uh, elasticity and creating money ex nihilo and, and and so on. Yeah, but 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 then like to try to bring it forward even, uh, even though not with a, with an end in sight yet one of the conclusion of my thesis that's now eight nine years ago was that we would need a different banking a different accounting system for, for banks you know that one of the big problem is that banks are using the same accounting standards as firm on the stock market and that's where part of the problem comes to now here for this discussion uh, with the NIPA account, the national account, I, I want to point you out because I ended up in the fiscal council, I finished there last year, that the international public accounting standards are different. And then you have, so the IPSAS for, for those who want to dig into this, and then you have the GFS, the governmental financial statistics from IMF. And, and so already there we have, data points and accounting standards on the national side and then we have the international accounting standards using data from all transactions like normally in all firms banks and non-banks yeah and then uh, from these two problem sets we have the evolvement of the financial market with the the very important addition and the change where mark to market is brought into accounting. So you have actual market prices coming in as the third dimension of, of uh, not blowing things up, but yeah, making things move more. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe to add based on Dan's final third question, not even only going into Bank of China or Amazon, but just you know from the financial crisis, if you would be able to monitor uh, lending and create credit construction, it actually also happens within firms. So when a real estate firm is asked for extension of um, uh, payment of the rental agreement from 30 days to 60 days from the tenant, then that's already creating like a banking activity within the accounts payable accounts receivables you know so 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 these are it's, kind of uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a way. I mean, you can think of it in, in many different ways. You can think of that as um, increasing the velocity of a given stock of uh, payments. Effectively, what you're saying is I, you're relaxing the settlement constraint, I guess, uh, using uh, Perry's language, which says, I am not going to be repaying you today. I'll be repaying you only in the future. So I don't worry. Let, let me skip one payment or if you like is as if you were actually doing it but uh, so yeah effectively you're avoiding uh, for one particular period you, you're avoiding the settlement constraints so there you, you can do it two ways you can actually try and borrow if you don't have the money and pay the money back or you simply say i'm not going to pay you I'll pay you just in the future. It, it, clearly, it's it's the same thing. Obviously, it is the same thing. Actually, in the uh, we have a paper again with PT and and uh, another colleague of ours, Purichai, uh, which is a a model in which we have banks that create money, and we try and see what the possible implications are.
of that. But clearly, this is not This is not what happens in DSG models because in DSG <laughs> models, uh, it's um, uh, again going back to this question of saving and uh, financing distinction. Banks, what they do is they allocate. You may call them banks. You may not call them banks or whatever. You have this entities uh, that allocate a given amount of resources as opposed to creating uh, purchasing power that will allow you to generate resources. Mm -hmm. Great. Let's take two questions this time, Claudia, if that's OK with you. Um, sure. Let's go to Nasha and Alex first. We have about 13, 15 minutes left in the session before we go to break. So Tinasha, you go first. All right. Uh, thank you, Jay, and uh, very interesting discussion. Um, so Claudia, I've got a question for you about national accounts, and I, I'm trying to contextualize this in a, in a post-Second World War 1950s context. Um, there are arguments that uh, the architecture of, you know, the institutionalization of national accounts, uh, particularly in the 1960s, I don't know whether it's by design or default, uh, pushed the African countries to follow the peg as it were, and to lose a sort of imagination of how their own post-colonial economies could look like. Mm. So particularly because they had to follow these national accounts and they had to use these GDP figures that had to be posted with uh, particularly the IMF and the World Bank, it is sort of, uh, put a noose around them, where they're being pulled in the context of international economy to follow the peg and to continue being uh, junior partners in international trade. And even when you look at what's happening today, and I'll give an example of um, South Africa right now, yeah. today they increased uh, interest rates by 25 basis points, um, hiking the repo rate to 11.45%. And they, they, they're saying they're doing this to try and control inflation. Um, and they're following the US um, lead in this. And yet the context of South Africa is a context where I'm very lucky that I still have electricity. I think there'll be load shedding in an hour or so, right? Uh, unemployment is over 40%. Um, the economy is declining significantly. To what extent can you use those kind of interest rates to try and target inflation between three to six percent in an economy that's targeted in that way? Do you not think that those national accounts are misleading in that sense? Thank you. Uh, th uh, no, thanks for the question. Uh, first of all, I am not familiar with the uh, the problems that you mentioned of the 50-60s, so I, I, I don't think I would be able to give you a, an informed um, answer on the things that I am more familiar with, which is basically the, the current fight against inflation. Um, first, I don't think that that has much to do with uh, or uh, anything to do with the, the way that we measure uh, output and the like, because for the reason that you said, uh, unemployment uh, is not really part of the national accounts and, uh, and we measure it separately. Uh, and that is basically what you're concerned with. And it's something that the central bank can observe without having to use the prism of the, uh, of the NIFA. Um, is monetary policy uh, the, uh, the right way? Well, we have, uh, we have a system which assigns, for good reasons, given the historical experience, um, to monetary policy the um, the objective of uh, keeping control of inflation. Is it sufficient? I would say no, for many uh, reasons that I've been arguing over the years. But is, is it important? I say yes, price stability is key. Um, and they are, the way that monetary policy operates is by trying to influence expectations and therefore the expectations of uh, labor and firms. And it, it, by trying to contract aggregate demand to reduce to reduce pressures on prices. So if you have an inflation problem, then you will have to raise interest rates. Then it's a question of judgment as to how far you will have to raise them. And there are also issues as to whether other complementary policies can help you deal with this or not. But 
from the perspective of the central bank, higher inflation, concerns about inflation becoming entrenched, does mean that monetary policy has to be tightened. And this was also the message that we had in, in last year's annual report, where we actually discussed a new way of thinking about inflation, which is these two regime views and transitions across regimes. So that's that's what I can tell you. Now, I'm sure that is not a fully satisfactory answer, but it's, it's a simple answer. Uh, uh, if, if I may quickly, one of the prerequisites to being part of the IMF and the World Bank to be able to get special drawing rights was if you followed the NIA framework that was made in the 1950s. Yeah, was and I guess necessary? that it's, and your special drawing yeah. rights are also based on your, yeah. On, but, but it seems to me that there is nothing wrong with that. Uh, I, 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 I do think that the NEPA counting is, is helpful in, uh, in uh, understanding how the economy works. Uh, it's, it's not the end of the story, but it's an important building block in that story. Thank you. Alex, you're next. Yeah, so, so Claudio, you said that when developing a new accounting system or going out and collecting a bunch of data, uh, you first want to figure out what you want to do with that. Uh, and, and I think that makes a lot of sense. So my question for you is, um, what do you wish you could do with accounting and measurement and data uh, that you can't do right now? What do you want to achieve? And, and what is the absence of, uh, of accounting and measurement uh, preventing you from doing? <laughs> no, that's... Uh, that's a big uh, question. Uh, first of all, I I, I think I, I'm not I'm not in a position to uh, I haven't reached the stage where I can think of um, an alternative way of uh, uh, measuring the world, uh, if you like. Uh, also, sort of bringing together this real and financial aspects more more closely. I know what the building blocks are. I think that what we can work with what we have. Um, something that I think is important and the BIS, and, and these are sort of smaller bits of the problem. Something that we think is important um, is to think of the world as uh, a set of inter uh, interlocking balance sheets. Uh, where going back to this issue of the triple coincidence where there is no um, uh, no coincidence between the unit that makes decisions and national borders, because but we know this. We've had uh, multinational companies for many many years, and uh, they were they've been multinational companies in the industrial sector. There are multinational companies. The ones that we focus on ourselves is uh, in the banking sector. Okay, uh, so you want to look at the world not just through the balance of payments account, but you would like to construct, if you like, another set of accounts that are based on what we call consolidated balance sheets, where the, uh, the accounts correspond to the unit that is making decisions. Um, and in fact, uh, I think you mentioned one of your former students. I understand that Gets from Peter is, is uh, one of your former students. And um, he had started a project with uh, another colleague of mine, Bob McCauley, with whom we have written papers together in order to construct the, that. But it proved to be too difficult. Um, so that is one way. And the second way is, as part of those interlocking balance sheets, uh, it's important to take into account the currency dimension uh, because of course the dollar is in particular is a huge international currency, is the currency of the world. Uh, and you cannot understand how the world works without taking that into, into account. Um, and here at the BIS, we are trying to develop those ideas and to as far as we can. Um, and for example, as, uh, as Perry knows, the uh, the latest piece that we wrote with Bob McCauley and another colleague here is about what we call missing or hidden debt. Uh, 
which is the fact that if you just even look at the balance sheets as we measure them today, because uh, FX swaps are measured on the net and not on a gross basis, we're missing a huge we're missing a huge amount of repayments, particularly uh, in dollars, uh, that have to be made, and that are not where uh, nowhere to be seen. We, you can actually measure the aggregate stock, but you can it's very very hard to understand where that stock is, and um, and that's uh, what my colleagues have been trying to do through some kind of detective work and some assumptions that they have to make. But that's huge. And people are not focusing on it, which is why we wrote this article. And we changed. We wrote something like this many years ago. I think it was in 2017. No one paid attention. We tried to change the rhetoric to get a little bit more attention, and we got a bit more these days. But this is, is nowhere to is, be seen. Is this the the, um, the, the FX swap business? The yeah. the hidden yeah the hidden debt of the, yeah yeah. I mean, what's extraordinary yeah. is that accounting standards, and now we're going to the not about the international banking statistics or whatever, or the balance of payment statistics, but we're just talking about the accounting standards of individual firms do not require them to disclose. I mean, you can argue whether you should account on it on a, on a gross or net basis, whatever. And again, going back to the accounting issues that I was discussing before, you can have arguments one way or the other, but what I don't think you can argue with is that one of the accounting principles is that if something raises some material risk, you should disclose it. Uh, and I think these things do uh, are re represent material risks, and therefore you should disclose them. Actually, if I if I had more energy, I, I, I would start a campaign to have that done. But uh, I don't. <laughs> I hope others will take will take the baton. Great. I think we have time for sort of closing remarks. Maybe Claudio and Perry, would you like to say some closing words uh, for the group? Um, well, perhaps I'll take the lead. The um, I see Claudio shaking his head. I first of all, I just want to thank you for for coming. I think this is so thought provoking, inspirational, um, and I I I will note at the end <laughs> too. The, the difference between somebody who has spent their life at the BIS and somebody who's left, that spent their life in academia, that, you know, Claudio has so much experience, like the, the world keeps changing and we just have to change with it. And we're using pragmatically what we have now, you know, to be able to do that. Um, and I think that's, that is probably the right thing. You know, if you're in a position like the the BIS, okay, and probably the right thing for a professor like me, you know, who is not in the day to day, you know, is to is to think is to think in in another way, and to and to and to and to try to synthesize, to try, or as as Dan was saying, maybe you don't know Claudia. That Dan, Dan Nielsen is also one of my students. Um, mm -hmm. uh, was it was it was a TA um, a few years after Getz on Peter, as a matter of fact. So um, and there and there are others other others here too. You know, when you talk about the world as an as a set of interlocking balance sheets, okay, everyone on this call. <laughs> thinks that way, just to let you know that that, that, that is a core tenant of what I call the money view, um, is that we're starting with that, that every entity is a cash inflow outflow entity, that they're linked. And so that I am connected to every single entity in the entire world, you know, indirectly through the, through this link. And uh, the question is, analytically, you know, what are the consequences of that? How can we, how can we model that? How can we Think about that, and that's the challenge that we're, you know, that 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 this this money view is about. And I I think we have two little ideas, you know, yeah. the yeah. settlement constraint that the timing matching the timing matters, okay, and the dealer function that that you know the 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 order flow patterns um, to push prices around, um, and maybe there are other ideas, you know, but for the moment those are kind of the two ideas that that. That that everything else sort of follows from that, um, and it's taken me twenty years to have those two ideas. So um, <laughs> uh, and to realize how fun you know how foundational they are. Okay, and to and to track some of their implications in order to inspire others. Okay, and so what you, what you don't know, Claudio, is the next couple of days 
people who've taken the 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 online course um, and or have been part of this conversation for some years are going to be talking about their own uh, their own and hope their own uh, research and and their and presenting their own papers. The purpose of this session is to try to inspire people to present papers on these questions next year. <laughs> so we may we may have something for you. You know that's 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 <laughs> that the great. goal. That's the goal. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Um, so the only thing that I would like to maybe a couple of thoughts. Um, the first one is that I have to say that have been I have been extremely fortunate because I think that if you work in an organization like this. You, you are exposed to so many different perspectives and so on that if you, if you have the initiative to try and work in different areas and the like, um, that really helps you form a, a worldview, which is well informed. I mean, it may be wrong, but it's definitely well informed. Um, and on top of that, I've, have, I've been fortunate enough to work with uh, great colleagues that uh, have really uh, pushed me and have uh, uh, tried together with me to push the boundaries of the way that we think about things. And related to that, that one advantage of working at, at international. So I, I really feel that relative to many academics, uh, we have a big advantage and I, I'm always impressed about academics that come up with the very clever ideas and ideas that can have lots of applicability without having the benefit of being exposed to all of these issues that, um, that we are in the area, of course, that we are working on. Uh, the other good point about an international institution like this, which is, is, uh, really relieves us from a constraint in academia, uh, is this idea that you need to publish in journals in, in order to, uh, to make progress, because it is a very difficult business. And um, if, you, uh, if you don't conform with certain norms of certain ways of looking at things, um, it's very, very tough to publish. Um, uh, so my final thought is that I would strongly encourage everyone to, to think outside the box, uh, but definitely to do uh, that in a very disciplined and, and logical way. Uh, and trying to combine, I think, a good understanding of what is actually happening out there in the world, as opposed to maybe starting from big theory and trying to uh, but that's my way, but you could do it both ways. Uh, um, and, uh, and apply your, your intellectual ability to understanding that sometimes moving away from some of the constraints that you would actually have to face in, in a very strict academic world. I think that's very important, but it has to be done in a, in a very disciplined uh, intellectual way. So just it's uh it's uh i, I thought you were doing as you can. it sounded to me like you were doing a recruitment pitch come <laughs> work at the <laughs> bis really. i wasn't trying i was okay <laughs> okay Thank you so much, Claudio. Really, this has been been great, and I agree with Oscar. I want to I want to go back and and watch the recording of this. <laughs> go more slowly. You know, that's one of the advantages we have in academia. You mentioned some big disadvantages. You know, and I can tell you how I've worked around those disadvantages, uh, mostly by writing books. Um, but uh, the uh, but one of the advantages is that we have more time. You know, that we're not we're not being and and that we have this discipline of teaching. If you have to explain yeah. things to undergraduates, you can't just talk, you know, bullshit. You know, they they oh, want to they want to know how the world works, and so that's know, actually, actually a big I, intellectual discipline. Yeah. No, I, I that's true, and I have to say yeah. that uh, I actually clarify my mind on on a number of issues a lot when I was teaching at the university. So it was yeah. it was a great sort of great tool or mechanism uh, to to get to understand. Uh, mm -hmm. to get rid of some of the ambiguities or inconsistencies in, in your own thinking. Jay, you want to give us instructions? Yes, first of all, thank you so much for this great session. We really appreciate it. And Claudio, um, we'd 
we really hope we can have you back sometime soon. Maybe we can present you some actual results and uh, of uh, the fruits of this conversation. Um, but uh, if you would like to teach a class or even a course, be, be our guest. We are going to be your students anytime. Um, but we'll stop the recording here. And thanks again.